Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 365 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I am a speaker and an author. Our third book is just recently released. It's called From Letters to Leaders, Leveraging Your Fraternity or Sorority Experience to Land Your Dream Job. So go and pick up that book today on Amazon. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, we love all of the folks at St. Leo University. Edson O'Neill, of course, he's one of our speakers, a graduate and former staffer at St. Leo. And believe it or not, the president of St. Leo University, Dr. Ed Dades, is actually one of the authors in our second book. It's called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing. And Dr. Dades, the president of the university, is in one of our books. So we have lots of ties to St. Leo University, and we have another great St. Leo University connection on the show with us today. Dr. Drew Gold is the Associate Professor of Management at St. Leo University with a concentration on emotional intelligence, professional and personal development, strategic planning and innovation management. He has an extensive background in strategic technology and innovation management and finance as well. He's done extensive work with athletes and students at St. Leo University on developing and harnessing the power of emotions for improved performance. Drew can show you how you can train yourself to improve performance and relationships in all aspects of your life. His other specialties include innovation and technology management, strategic advising, management consulting, financial analysis, and of course, emotional intelligence training. Welcome to the show, Drew. Great, thank you. So glad to be here. Thrilled to be able to share some knowledge with people today. Absolutely. The college students, you know, they love hearing from professors from all over the country, and you have some great information to share. So I couldn't wait to get you on the show, start talking about emotional intelligence, servant leadership. I mean, you're an expert in so many really, really cool areas. But I want to go all the way back to your undergraduate experience, because you decided on the Ohio State University for your experience. Why did you end up choosing Ohio State? Well, it's funny, growing up in Columbus, Ohio State, or I should say the Ohio State University, is actually the university kind of last resort. Um, you know, you go to high school there and you want to get out of town. My first year of college was actually at the University of Arizona, uh, trying to get through an engineering program. And I very quickly found out engineering was not for me. So <laughs> I went back home and started at a community college just to get back into the swing of things. Wound up at Ohio State and just had a wonderful experience. Uh, people are concerned about the size of the school, but, you know, you find your little groove, you find your little niche, and you make it what you will. And I had a wonderful experience, made some great friends. I still am in touch with quite a few of them today and absolutely loved it and obviously became a diehard football fan in the process. Believe it or not, Kirk Herbstreet was the quarterback when I was school there. And he's a much better announcer than he ever was a quarterback. Yeah. Keep him in the booth. You know, I'm not so sure about his football talents, but in the booth, he's great. So He's fabulous. Yeah, I love the guy. He's fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I figured as a Columbus guy, you'd want to get out of the Ohio and, State University. And I did, but I somehow wound up back there again. But it's funny because one of my best friends at Ohio State, both of us, when we were at school together, said, okay, we've got to get out of this town. Right. And we did. I wound up moving to London and then wound up in Wall Street for some time. He wound up in San Diego. It, it's funny, a friend of his, his roommate in Ohio State, got a job with Intel in San Diego, and he went to work for Hobart Corporation in Dayton. And when his friend got the job with Intel, he's like, okay, I'm just going to quit and head out there. And he did, and he wound up getting uh, with Toyota Motor Credit, Lexus Financial Services. And has been there now for like 25 years or so. But both of us made it out of Ohio. My family's still there, so I still go back. And in all honesty, Columbus is a great town. Yeah. It has really come into its own. My family's there. I get there a few times a year. It wasn't when I was going to school. There right. wasn't much there. But mm -hmm. over the last 30 years or so, it really has come into its own. And I, I love visiting. There's a lot of stuff to do there. You know, it's a, it's a great place. Yeah, a lot more infrastructure today. So yeah. you're now the Associate Professor in Management at St. Leo University. Tell our audience, I mean, what's the best part about being an Associate Professor? 
you know, the, and all ego removed from it is the ability to impact lives. Yeah. It's the ability to make changes and, and to get students to realize their potential. And, you know, when I started there, I took over an MBA class that was kind of seen as the weed out class. And I flipped it on its head and said, look, you know, why are the, why are we trying to weed people out? Let's get them the skills necessary to succeed. And I've adopted that throughout my career at St. Leo. And I just, I love it. People that come into my stats class are freaked out the first day because of numbers and statistics. In this last term, the last day of class, I had a couple of students saying, you know, this was my favorite class. And you never hear that for statistics, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But I try to make it practical. I try to get it so that the students enjoy the learning process. I'm a firm believer that humor in the classroom is a great way for the students to learn. You gotta bring down that stress and anxiety because when stress and anxiety are up here, they don't retain. And if you can get control of that and get the students to reduce that stress and anxiety, and it's all up here, it's all in the mind, then they have a much better experience. So for me, it's all about really just being able to impact lives. And, and to be honest with you, being a teacher is my purpose in life. I've been doing it since I was 10 years old. My dad brought home an Apple II computer, said, okay, kids, hands off. You can't touch it. I'll use it for work. Within two weeks, I was showing him how to use the computer. <laughs> and, you know, the tech side has followed me everywhere. Um, I've, I've built my own computers for the past 30 years, every desktop that I've owned. But teaching, I, I'm a scuba instructor on the side. Um, as I look back over my life and every aspect of my life, even at Ohio State, I was tutoring people. As I was going through the accounting classes, people were struggling. And we had a big study group of 20 or 30 people, and I helped them get through it. So for me, teaching is my purpose, and, and I love it. it. It was so rewarding when you get somebody, especially the first day of class, and like the deer in the headlights. And by the end of the class, they're relaxed, and you know they learned the material, and they enjoyed the ride. That's awesome. I love that. I listen, I totally understand where you're coming from. I love teaching students as well, especially college students. Uh, there's something really remarkable that you can do at that age with the students. Um, and you know what? You're absolutely right. When I was in my master's program, statistics was the class that was the buzzsaw. That was the one where students were dropping out. I mean, you know, you could see it. They were just little deer in headlights, like, yeah. I got to get out of here. And they quit, and then you never saw them again. And, yeah. you know, it shouldn't be that way. You know, I, I think the issue that we had with my statistics professor was that he was actually from NASA. So Ooh. he came from NASA and then went into higher ed, and he was trying to teach statistics. And he's teaching it as if it's a room full of NASA staff and meanwhile you got students from like you know the theater department yeah. <laughs> like all these other places not necessarily from the business school and they came to me one day and they said mike you know the teacher is speaking another language in statistics like i don't even understand what's going on and i remember taking all my notes you know i literally we met on my car right parked right outside the classroom i took all my notes spread it across the hood of my car and i'm literally teaching the lesson but in a way that the students can understand it on my car and the professor walks up and he sees me holding court with all of the class outside of my car teaching them and he was laughing and sure enough he sent me an email he said mike were you teaching my course on your car and i said <laughs> yes absolutely i, I love it <laughs> I love it. And it's, you know what? He was grateful, though, because, you know, he knew that for whatever reason, he just he knew his statistics backwards and forwards. But you have to, you know, teach it in a way that the students can digest it. You've got to make it so that, number one, they can relate to it. Yeah. And number two, it's not so intimidating for them. Right. That's the real big thing with stats. They walk in. I had an MBA student um, years ago and. I teach the first class in the MBA professional development. That's the one I was telling you about that we kind of shifted to really building them up. And almost every week, it was an eight week class at night. And every week he'd come up to me and say, Dr. Gold, I can't believe I sucked at accounting as an undergraduate. What am I going to do? I got to take an accounting class. And my first statement to him was just shut up and stop talking about it because <laughs> you're not going to take it for another year. Now, <laughs> can you imagine going through and I worked with him to change his mindset about the class. And a couple of his cohort members were reinforcing that after he had my class. So by the time he walked in, he was a lot more relaxed. But if we hadn't done that, could you imagine obsessing over that for a year? You know, he would have walked into that class. He would have failed it before he even walked in. 
mm-hmm. because you would have been so panicked. The stress and anxiety would have been up here. And when you have those levels of stress and anxiety, you can't think clearly, you can't think rationally. Analytic thought, creative thought goes out the window. Yeah. You ended up getting an A in the class. There you go. There you go. You're absolutely right. You know, we got to eliminate all of those. You know, the mindset has a lot to do with your success. If you go into something saying, I'm going to fail accounting, well, guess what? You know, you, you just might. You got to change going that to. mindset. If you, if you convince yourself you're going to, you will find a way. <laughs> you won't find a way. You won't do your it. homework, whatever, you know. But, uh, yeah, man, we got to, I think accounting and statistics, those two typically are the buzzsaw in whatever program you're going yes. for. Yes. So yes, you exactly. get all of that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. like and, that. And like you said, it's that. It's that mindset. It's you know, a it's, mindset. It's, and that's the base of my approach. And that's why my approach is so different to emotional intelligence, because the baseline is what I call the seven C's. And it's what I call the mindset of optimal performance. Mm-hmm. And it's really, we can talk about that in a moment, but it's really changing your own belief structure about yourself. Mm, yeah, I love that stuff. Now, you also served as a university Senate president from 2018 to 2022, which if you know anything about higher ed, this was a, a major uh, you know, point in, in higher ed because of the pandemic. What were your responsibilities in that position as university Senate president? And what were some of the difficulties you had to deal with during that time? Basically, it's organizing and keeping everything going. We have 15 different committees. And they're they're made up not just of senators, but of faculty members, staff members, administrators, things like that. Everything from looking at the curriculum to looking at, um, you know, the technology infrastructure, the university, disciplinary stuff, um, all these different committees. And we had 68 members in the Senate. So a big part of my responsibility is just making sure that all those committees get staffed properly, working with the president, working with the various administrators, working with the deans to make sure that all the committees have good representation on them. And then working with the president of the university and administration, just to make sure that things are running smoothly, that the faculty and the staff, if there are issues that they're experiencing, communicating that with the administration, things like that. And, and obviously the disruption of COVID was a major, major hurdle, just like everybody, but we have a big online presence. We, we were one of the early movers into online education. So we already had the infrastructure. So it really was transitioning from the on ground to online. And we canceled classes for a couple of weeks while we were able to get the technology and get all that content moved over from the online course to those on ground courses for the faculty and make sure that we were communicating with everybody. But then we got up and running real quick. Um, You know, the the biggest challenges really were in, in handling the tensions between the faculty and the staff and the administration and trying to kind of play peacemaker at the same time, moving things forward and making sure that we're functioning and doing what we need to do as a Senate to help guide the university and to help, you know, the university function based on all these committees that we have help. It's really an advisory role. Yeah, well, you did a wonderful job there. And you know what? It's all about good leadership at universities and you have one of the best with Ed as your president. Uh, as an awesome guy. You know, he is a Buckeye. Yeah. He's, he's, he's also Spartan. So when I run across him, it's funny because the first thing we always talk about, especially in the fall, is what's going on with the Ohio State football team. <laughs> That's where we start. <laughs> That's where we always start. He's, I've known Ed for 10 years. He is a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, genuinely one of the nicest people that you will meet and truly cares about not just St. Leo but really cares about the faculty, the staff, and the students, the entire community. You yeah. know, everybody from, you know, the food service to our lawn maintenance guys, to the faculty in the classrooms, to all the administrative support, he really, he really loves everybody. Yeah. And it shows in his approach. He is just, he's genuinely a nice guy. Yeah, he's a, he's a man of the people, you know, he's he really, really is. And I love that about him. He's not afraid to get down in the weeds and to, you know, work with anybody, you know, the maintenance folks, you know, at St. Leo. And you got to appreciate somebody like that. I mean, you know, it, it's real easy to be at the top of the ivory white towers, you know, yeah. somewhere in the stratosphere, but he doesn't live there. He lives no. with the people. He's a man of the commoners. And I love that about him, that and he's willing to he's get his hands dirty. Well, he spent so much time as a faculty member. Right. You know, he was administrator under Dr. Kirk, and then he transitioned over to faculty yeah. and back into administration. So he understands the whole picture. Yeah. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows what everybody's dealing with. And he's been there for 30 years, 25 yeah. years. It seems like forever. 
<laughs> and so he knows the people, he knows the culture. And, you know, we've had our struggles coming back from COVID. And we ended up having leadership before Ed took over that made a couple of tough decisions that didn't work out very well. So Ed's come in and we've had to kind of redirect ourselves and reorganize ourselves. And we're moving in a direction that everybody, I think, is really excited about where we're heading now. It was a struggle, just like all universities struggled during COVID, yeah. right? Everybody had a hard time. And there were a lot of issues with enrollment and with student retention and things like that. We saw tons of schools shut down. Yeah. You know, schools were closing almost every week or two. You'd hear about another university shutting its doors, even ones that have been around for 80 and 100 years. It was just a very challenging time to be in a university. And I think we've weathered that storm. And now we're in a position with Ed's leadership to really take off to, you know, kind of move St. Leo up to the next level. That's fantastic news. I love all of it. Now, you know, I want to talk about emotional intelligence because you have a lot of expertise here and you have a book that's coming out. It's going to be called Beyond Emotional Intelligence, Find and Master Your Emotional Light Switch. And I know you have your own approach to emotional intelligence. It's a little bit different than conventional wisdom. What is your approach? How is it different than everything else out there? I think the, the basis, there's two real fundamental, well, actually three fundamental differences. Number one is I focus on mindset first. And that's what I was telling you about the seven C's. Mm -hmm. It's about getting people to believe in themselves, to believe that you know they can do what they set themselves out to do, things like that. So the one of the first C's is called choice. Because if you think about choice, it's really setting an emotional baseline. So Think about the emotion you're experiencing if you feel like you have to do something, right? Versus you get to or choose to do something. You know, having to do something implies that you don't really want to do it. You're being forced into doing something you don't really want to do. You have to do this, right? There's no choice involved. Choice is freedom. So that, that one sea of choice really sets you in an emotional baseline in a much more positive position. So that's just one of those seven seeds. The other thing that I really focus in on is what I call emotional drivers. Excuse me. Those are different aspects of individuals that predispose people to feeling certain emotions in certain contexts. And I'll give you an example. Introvert, and I'm not saying introverted is good or bad. It is what it is, right? But a tendency for people that are introverted, they get uncomfortable and nervous in front of crowds. They don't like strange people. They don't like interacting with people they don't know. Things like that. So just understanding that dynamic helps you be able to identify when you're in that kind of a position and how you can better cope with that. And my book goes through, I've got about 30 different skills that I outline in my book. And it really starts with those seven C's understanding those emotional drivers. I simplify the process instead of self and social awareness and self and relationship management are widely seen as the, the four core emotional intelligence skills. I really simplify it and I just have three. And it's all about just identifying what's going on, recognizing when that's occurring and then changing what you do, how you respond. And then the last part is what I call emotional creators, where you actually, this is where that light switch comes in. Mm -hmm. If you understand the power of different things like word choice and music. And you can harness that. You have the ability to flip an emotion on and off like a light switch. And I'll give you a quick example. I use a lot of, um, I talked a lot about word choice. And those people will say, you know, 70%, 80% of what we say is not in our vocabulary. It's in how we say it. It's in body language. It's in tone and things like that. That's true to some extent. But there's also words that can set you off just like that. Right? There's words that we all have that are bad words that will inflame your emotion no matter how nicely you say that. Mm -hmm. Words have an emotional context. To them. So I challenge my students to change. The first thing is challenge the way they respond when somebody asks, how are you? And Tony Robbins talks this a, a lot. Don't just be okay or good. Be outstanding. Be fabulous. Be fantastic. Right? Set yourself apart. And one of my colleagues at school keeps asking me, when are you ever not fantastic? I said, never, because I choose not to be. I want to be fantastic. I want to live at that level. So I made the mistake of telling my emotional intelligence. I created a, a class on emotional intelligence and leadership. And I made the mistake of challenging them. And one of them said, okay, I'll be fantastic if you be super califragilistic expialidocious every time somebody asks you how you are for the next two days. 
So, okay, I'm down for the challenge. Second mistake, telling my wife. <laughs> she immediately started to push my buttons and started to get me really, really pissed off. And I got really, my anger was like this. I was just furious. And then she said, how are you? Come on, how are you? Say it. I said, I'm super califragilistic expel on this. How do you think I am? And we just started cracking up. It was literally instantaneously. I went from a level of just being livid because if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Your spouse knows how to push your buttons. And she did that for like five minutes intentionally just to get me really, really pissed off. And then made me say it. And we just instantly, as soon as I said the word, I just busted out in laughter. And that was the end of that. <laughs> and that's the power of words, right? If you understand the power of words and the, what we're talking about in my book, you have the ability to control your emotions like a light switch. And now I'm not saying don't feel bad emotions, right? It's not about that. It's about, right, when I lose a family member, when I lose a pet, yeah, I go through the grieving process, but I don't let that run my life. Mm -hmm. I choose to remember the good things about them. You know, I'm upset for a short period of time, but then I put that behind me and move on with my life. People have a tendency to dwell in the negativity. And I think that's really what this approach is about. It's providing you some tools and techniques so that you can avoid dwelling there. You experience it. Emotions are designed to move through us. Emotion, right? They're designed to move through us, but a lot of people let them get stuck. It's good to let the good ones get stuck, but you don't want the bad ones to get stuck. You want to be able to just experience them and move on. Excellent and I think that's advice. what a large part of this book is about, is providing some of those tools and realizing that you actually, you don't have to live there. It's a choice. Coming back to those seven C's, that first C is choice. We have a choice. And if you Excellent. choose to live in that negativity, or you can choose to move on with it. Excellent advice. Really good stuff. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the fact that you work with some of the athletes and the students mm -hmm. at St. Leo on developing and harnessing the power of emotions for improved performance. Talk to our audience about some of the results that you've seen with the students after working with them. Oh, it's been, it's been tremendous. It's been so rewarding. Um, one of the examples I can give you is about eight or nine years ago, the cross country coach called me up and said, Hey, you know, we're running faster in practice than we do in the competition. Oh. <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to work. The other way around. <laughs> it's supposed to be the other way around. So I brought in the team and said, look, you know, I got a commitment from the coach. I need you guys to buy into this. Whatever's said here, we're in a safe place, right? There's going to be no retaliation. And over the course of a couple of hours, we uncovered that, her pre-race routine was causing a lot more stress. She came from Duke, you know, really intense, you know, big major division one school program. And it was a very intense approach that she had. And it was getting them, their nerves and anxiety were up here. She was creating fear. Oh my God, I got to do this. And, and she was basically freaking them out before they even got started. So we worked through that, changed up their pre-race routine. They went on the tear. They won the conference championships that year. You know, last year, the um, the tennis coach, actually two years ago, it would have been two years ago now, but the tennis coach called me up in the fall and, you know, they were struggling with some conflict and some issues like that. So we worked through them, ended up winning the conference championship. This year, they've actually, they even won the national title. I believe it was in women's, um, you know, they've done really, really well. And then this this past year, the cross country, the fall, right before their championship, the, the, the new cross country coach called me up and said, hey, you know, we're having some issues. Can you work through it? And it was really, for me, it's with, with athletes, it's about identifying triggers, right? What's causing that and really getting an in-depth examination for, okay, you've got to identify the trigger event that's causing you to perform badly. And then we work through a process where we mitigate and can even eliminate that trigger from their lives with some practice. Wow. So it's been really rewarding. The cross country team last fall did really well, excuse me, the, I worked with the men's basketball team a few years ago. I've worked with the swim team, with the, the, the lacrosse team a number of years ago. And we've had really, really good results. It's all about, you know, identifying why they're having stress and anxiety at this level. Because when you have levels of stress and anxiety that are this high, it really inhibits performance. Some people, it excels, right? But generally speaking, you have this curve. It's like a bell-shaped curve. And that inflection point at the top, you hit that level of anxiety, and it's more like a cliff. And some people can hit that and keep going and have that high level of performance. But the vast majority of us, when they hit that inflection point, it's like dropping like a rock. You know, their performance just tanks. 
So avoiding number one, getting to that inflection point and figuring out how you can, like part of what I talk about is path dependency and realizing that at any point in time, you can change your path. You're not stuck on that path, right? It's a choice coming back to those seven C's. So taking some action, once you identify what's causing that acceleration and stress and anxiety, doing something before it gets to the point where you're just way up here and not able to perform. Really good stuff. I think every athletic director in the country needs to call you, Drew, and get some I advice. It. I would love it. I, <laughs> I mean, love working with the students. I love working with the athletes. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. My book, I was hoping to have it done by the end of the summer, but I've been experiencing some long COVID symptoms with uh, fatigue and brain fog that that's pushed it back a little bit, but I'm still hoping to have it done by you know maybe the end of July now. Yeah, that's going to be a great resource for a lot of athletes all over the country. You know, speaking of another book, you know, one of my favorites, of course, is uh, Robert Greenleaf and uh, Servant Leadership, yeah. uh, which I always uh, carry close to me. And it talks about great leaders being seen as servants first. And yeah. that ultimately is how leaders are going to motivate all the people that work for us. You know, it's not with their hands. It's more about, you know, getting into their minds and their hearts. Uh, and so what are some of the leadership skills that are needed in order to accomplish Greenleaf's vision in terms of servant leadership? I'm going to keep it real simple for you. Yeah. Number one, remove the ego. It's not about ego. Number two is recognize that everybody has something to contribute. And number three is a focus on others, not yourself. There you go. That's really what it boils down to. As a leader, it's not about me. It's about what I can do for you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of leaders don't view things that way. And they're starting to come around because you want to get, you want people to follow you, right? And the way to get people to follow you is to not just guide them, but to focus on them. What is it that you need to do to help them? Maybe they're having some issues, work through, you know, whether it be something with a conflict at work or you know, some, if you look at the needs hierarchy, unmet needs, um, you know, just even some of the basic ones right now, you know, food and shelter and things like that, especially in Tampa, rents have gone sky high. Yeah. And, you know, people can't afford to live. So what can you do to help them through those types of issues and providing yourself, not just as a leader, but as a resource and as mm -hmm. a guide? You know, I've actually, if you look me up, you've, I've got a couple of papers that we published on servant leadership with a couple of my colleagues at St. Leo. I wasn't the lead author. Dr. Charles Hale was one of my good friends at St. Leo. But it really, it boils down to really just focusing on others. It's not about the ego. It's about what can I do for you? Right. Yeah, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Yeah, I mean, you're always thinking about yourself, but yeah. you really have to put the focus on your people. And if you do that, then suddenly everything starts working. So for if you're a new student leader in a student organization, pick up Robert Greenleaf's book, Servant Leadership, start talking about Maslow's hierarchy and really start yeah. understanding yeah. what those levels are. Because if yeah. you have people on your team and they don't they have these unmet needs at the base of Maslow's yeah. hierarchy, you're not going anywhere. You're never gonna yeah. get, you know, all these people to execute at the top of the pyramid. It's mm -hmm. never going to happen. No, they've got to hit those lower level needs, yeah. even the middle levels, those belonging needs, yeah. right? People yeah. feel like they're outcasts, things like that. They're never going to get to that level of self-actualization, which is really akin to servant leadership, right? Yeah. Self-actualization is really, it's a focus on others, giving yeah. back, making contributions, things like that. So there's a lot of overlap between those. Yeah, well, that's one of the big reasons why I'm such an advocate for the fraternity and sorority system is the love and belonging, because I think that's where it comes in really, really big. And then we can get them to self-actualization eventually. Yeah. Uh, so that's really good. And, you know, speaking of good leaders, there have been a lot of uh, visionaries in recent times that have been really good at shaping organizational culture. You know, mm -hmm. I start thinking about guys like Steve Jobs, for example, Bill Gates, yeah. uh, you know, and if our student organizations, such as a fraternity or sorority, they all have a mission. They all have a vision and certain values that were developed over 100 years ago by their founders. But the members today, whether it be St. Leo or the Ohio State, uh, they're clearly taking actions sometimes outside of those stated values. Yeah. And I think about all the recent cases that we see on college campuses, hazing, uh, sexual assaults, alcohol and drug abuse, for example. So how do we get accountability from our members and stay true to the mission? vision and values over time that's a great question it, it really has to do with repercussions and, and like you said accountability mm. right it's holding their feet to the fire that's one of the things that steve jobs is famous for you can come to me with just about any idea but 
if it fails, I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Mm-hmm. Right. And that was his approach. And people, people loved it and people hated it because they were afraid to go to him with ideas because if they failed, it might've cost them their jobs. But a lot of times we don't see repercussions. Yeah. We don't see people held to the fire. So it really is, it's, there's a couple of different things. Number one, understanding why they're not coinciding. Why is that conflict with the values and with the purpose and with the mission and the vision of the fraternity? Why is that in conflict with what people are doing? And get into the source of the why. And then once you do that, and that's going to come back to a lot of psychology, unmet needs. Tony Robbins talks about the need for significance. A lot of these behaviors, people have a very high need for significance and the way they accomplish that is by putting other people down. So what are some other ways we can get that need met in a healthy and more productive manner? If they have a really high need for significance, you know, get them involved with leadership, get them more involved so that they can meet that need, so they can make feel like they're making a difference, they're making a contribution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think students today do have a lot of difficulty with accountability. I mean, we have certain systems in place, like a judicial board, for example, where mm-hmm. peers are holding uh, other students accountable for their actions. So, you know, if I take my fist and I, you know, punch a hole in the sheetrock at the fraternity house, you know, somebody's got to hold me accountable. I got to replace yeah. that, you know, somehow. Um, and so I think that accountability, that's really where they struggle. And sometimes it, you know, it's on the university or the national headquarters to then come in with a membership review and actually do the accountability piece. And, and that you now you're not functioning, that. right? Yeah. You're not functioning you, properly. You never want to get to that level. Right. You want to be able to resolve these internally as much as you can. So again, understanding why the behavior is occurring and then taking corrective action. Yeah. And that's um, one of the things that I talk about in my book. It's just this modified process. It applies not just to emotional intelligence and what I'm talking about, but everything. Identify the source. Right? recognize when it's occurring and then taking corrective action to make sure that, you know, once it starts happening right off the bat, boom, we've got to nip this in the bud. We've got to change things. Mm-hmm. You know, I see a lot of conflict in student organizations. It seems to be endless. Each person in the student organization, you know, thinking about it, it's 18 to 22 year olds. Everybody yep. has their own vision of where they want to go. And yep. each person in that organization is motivated by something completely different. And yep. so we have to stop just motivating them all with the same strategy because not everybody is motivated by the same thing. So yep. how do we manage that conflict that always seems to come up in in organizations. So coming back to what we were talking about with servant leadership, got to remove the ego. It's not about me. It's about our organization. What is the best for the fraternity, right? If I have some ideas and I throw something out there and you disagree, we need to be able to engage in a discourse and not, I can't take it personally. Mm -hmm. If you disagree with me, hey, fine, let's talk about and let's work through this. And that's where these higher levels of emotional intelligence come in because you can shed the ego. And you can have these discussions without infuriating people. A lot of times people really just get angry when when you put out an idea and then people start picking it apart, right? That people take it personally and they get angry and they get frustrated and they take personal ownership of that. You gotta be able to remove that. It's not about me. And this comes back to the mission, the vision, the values, right? You really, number one, I think one of the things that can be done is you gotta be a little more selective about who you let in and make sure that they are consistent in their beliefs with the mission, vision, and values of the organization. That's number one. So you can nip it in the bud through the selection process to make sure that there's a consistency. When I started at St. Leo, I had to write a value statement, and I wrote this five-page essay about my own values, and I could have gone online and looked up St. Leo's values and then mimicked it, but I didn't. I wanted there to be a fit. And if you look at what I wrote versus the six core values of St. Leo, We say things slightly differently, but they're virtually identical. And that's how I've been there for 10 years, because there is not that conflict, right? I'm not in a constant conflict with who I am and what I believe in and my core values. St. Leo and I are like this in in terms of our approach. And the student organizations need to try to find people that have that kind of an approach, that have that meshed with your core values. The other thing that you can really do is try to ferret out the source of the conflict. And the vast majority of the time, Number one, it's a misunderstanding. Number two, it's a miscommunication. Or number three, it's a misunderstanding of the intent of the other individual. And I have exercises on these that uh, that I'm going into in my book, but the big one is intent, right? 
it's really misconstruing the intention of the other individual. You know, maybe I did something that really pissed you off. Was it my intent to piss you off? Probably not. But you took it. You misunderstood that intent. You thought that I was doing something to really get under your skin. And that creates conflict. So if you can understand intentions and try to pick apart those intentions, and this comes back to the psychology again, where you've got the needs, the motivating factors, things like that, belief structures, values, that all comes into play here. And it's very challenging to understand the psychology of other individuals, but the more you can understand that, the more you're going to be in a position to be able to avoid the conflicts that stem from those kinds of misunderstandings and disagreements. Yeah, you're 100% accurate. I mean, I don't think that the student organizations are doing a good enough job of making sure the students and their values match the organizations um, and asking those probing questions very, you know, before you decide to give them an invitation to join to make sure that we have a match. All too often, we take the lazy approach of just waiting for whoever comes to us because it's easy. And then we find out, oh, guess what? Our values are not in alignment and this thing is going to fall apart. So, I mean, it's kind of on us because we don't do that on the front end and we should. And you're absolutely right. You know, fraternities and sororities, if you understand the history of higher ed, I mean, it started really as debate. It was students debating things that weren't allowed to be debated on a college campus. So they took it off campus, started a house and started debating there. And so, you know, I think we have to open our minds to that debate and understand that there's going to be a lot of different opinions on a college campus. And that's OK. That's exactly what a college campus is designed for it is that's that's okay that's that's wonderful. the beauty of colleges and universities right. i mean it's it's wonderful to have all those different lenses and to have diverse students as saint leo certainly does um and so those are all good things and i think you know we have to start understanding we have to learn how to build consensus rather than just you know taking all right 60 percent of my chapter votes yes 40 percent says no so we're going to go with the yeses and then we just move on but we just lost the 40 percent that said no because we didn't stop to ask them why yeah. like let's like slow down here in this process and learn how to build consensus over yeah. time so that's a big part of it and one of the i teach um innovation also yeah. And one of the things that we learn that we, that we talk about in innovation is this concept of feedback, mm -hmm. right? If you put out an idea and we're not going to run with that idea, a lot of times it goes into this black hole and people are, okay, why am I even bothering anymore? If I get, they're not taking my ideas, they're not telling me anything about it. That's part of building consensus. Thank you for this idea. It was great. But right now is not the right time and explain to them why mm -hmm. and try to get them to buy into why their idea, while not necessarily a bad idea, maybe it's just an issue of timing or an issue of resources or something like that, but why you're not running with that. And a lot of leaders, unfortunately, have this mentality. I don't need to justify my decisions. You know, I'm the president, I'm the leader, I'm the CEO. I don't have to explain myself to people. And it's not about that. It's not about justifying why you make decisions. It's about getting people involved and explaining to them, hey, you know, we love your ideas, but this is not a time for them right now. But we still want to hear what you have because we value your opinions and everybody has something to contribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people just want to be heard, I think, in yeah. student organizations. I think they would be okay as long as they feel like their opinions were heard. If the majority yeah. feel you know, we're moving in a different direction or we're going to come back to that idea maybe a year from now or two years from now when conditions are better, I'm fine with that. But I just want to be heard. I think we lose people when they feel like their opinions aren't heard. It, yeah, it's definitely. Definitely. Thing. Um, you know, and we should talk about mental health, too, on college campuses, because stress and anxiety for college students right now, it's at an all time high. A recent study showed that more than 40 percent of students currently enrolled in an undergraduate degree program, they had considered dropping out in the past six months, which is up from 34 percent in the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. So how do we recognize the warning signs of mental health issues quickly on a college campuses, on college campuses, and what resources should we be providing the students with? Well, there's a couple of things, and it comes to recognition, number one. Like you said, recognizing the signs, faculty members, peers, friends, you know, behavior is a big indicator. You know, language is a big indicator of so being able to understand and say, oh, that guy's really having a hard time and then providing some resources for them, mm -hmm. right? We have counseling services at St. Leo. We provide hotlines, a number of different hotlines. We publicize it. We talk about it. It's in our syllabi. It's, in, it's very easy to be able to get access. 
through these tools. And one of the things that people need to understand, it's not meaning that you're weak if you want to ask for help. People see asking for help as a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. And this goes for leaders too. It's a sign of strength. It indicates that you're strong enough to know your limitations. Not everybody can do everything. You can handle everything. And just the recognition for yourself that, hey, I really need some help. And being able to get over that hump and say, yeah, I, I should ask for help. It's a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness, but people see it as a sign of weakness. They don't want to ask for help. Okay. And what happens is we see that downward slide where they start from a faculty member. I've seen it. You know, student misses a class here and there, and then all of a sudden they disappear for two weeks and don't respond to emails, right? And then I'll submit um, a report. I try to reach out to them. They don't respond to me. So I submit a report that, you know, somebody else will take it over and try to reach out to them and figure out what's happening. Uh, we have a lot of mechanisms in place from the faculty member's perspective. There's a lot of student organizations that have access to these as well. And just understanding you know, what's available, how to get access to that, recognizing those warning signs. And again, understanding that it's not a weakness. Being Asking somebody to help is a sign of strength. Yeah. And that's something that you need to go through life with that attitude because you're never going to get through life on your own without help. Period. 100%, 100%. We all need we all need help. I need help. You need help. We all need help at times. Right. Being able to get that in your mindset. Again, that's why we talk about the mindset in my book. It's the first thing I talk about. Getting that mindset. Asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. It's not about ego. Yeah. Right? It's, wow. about, it's about recognizing when I need help and having the strength to ask for that help. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I was actually watching uh, the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, documentary on Netflix. On Netflix. And yeah. uh, that was kind of how he wrapped it up. You know, he basically said, you know, because Arnold has had, you know, three careers, obviously, you know, champion bodybuilder, uh, obviously with the movies and then with the politics as a governor of California. He's had three distinct careers, um, but he's also had a lot of low lows. OK, this is a guy who's had high highs and low lows. Yeah. But he, he, anytime somebody, you know, says, hey, you know, you're a self-made man, you know, he immediately, he despises that <laughs> because he said, if you think that I got to where I am in life by myself, he said, a lot of really good people have helped me along the way to build this career, <laughs> okay? And he points them out. And unfortunately, a lot of them have passed away uh, over time and they're not even still here to see yeah. all the success. Um, but uh, but he really credits a lot of other people for helping and he's the strongest man in the world. I mean, let's just you know face it. If you look at you know his photos uh, when he was a champion bodybuilder, uh, you know, nobody can argue that or dispute that. Um, yeah. So, you know, so I think you're right. We have to get rid of the stigma surrounding the counseling center um, at your university and every other university out there. Uh, we have to talk about it more. I think that's really important. And I think there's some troubling trends, too, when it comes to young men, especially that they don't really have a lot of people to talk to. I think if you look at how many really, you know, close friends that they have, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about casual acquaintances. I'm talking about people that they can really kind of have these uh you know conversations these vulnerable conversations with other men you ask men at saint leo how many really close friends do you have mm -hmm. i'm telling you the answer is going to be zero for most of them they'll have acquaintances on campus yeah. but somebody yeah. that they're going to share what you're talking about mental yeah. health concern oh man it, i mean there's there's something troubling that's going on there with young men that i think we need to look a little bit closer at yeah and i think part of it again it's it's that mindset it's what you said vulnerability yeah. There's this stigma that men can't be vulnerable. Mm. And because of that, I think that's preventing a lot of them from reaching out, unfortunately. Mm. And believe it or not, even though they might have a bunch of different, like you said, acquaintances, and not really close friends, but I can guarantee you if they were having issues and they called one of those acquaintances and said, hey, yeah, I really need to talk. That's how you become close friends. Yeah. Right. That's how you get to develop those friendships is having these types of conversations and being able to support and guide and help one another. And our I'm very heavily involved in the doctoral program at St. Leo. And I teach the second class. And it's all about shifting people from the mindset of a professional to an academic. And I tell them the first thing that you really need to focus on is working together and supporting each other. Yep. And they come together in their cohorts. It's amazing. When they're having issues, they call each other on the phone. You know, they're there for each other. They really take that to heart. 
and they will call and say, oh my God, I'm having some issues. And, and they work, they talk to each other about it and work through it. And if you talk to the people that graduate with a doctorate from St. Leo, I can guarantee you that the vast majority of them will say they wouldn't have been able to do it without the support of their peers and the support of their families and the support of their faculty members. Yeah, you have to learn to depend on other people. It's the only way you can get through. I'm one year into my doctorate, and I'm telling you, if it wasn't for the rest of my cohort, I don't know how I'm going to make it through, but we will make it through together. That Anytime you need to talk through. about it, I've been there, done that. I know what you're dealing with. <laughs> I can help talk you down that cliff pretty easily. <laughs> It's a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. So it's all good. good. But, uh, yeah. So you know what? And one last thing. I mean, you know, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. And I tend to believe that you know something about good food. I need to know the next time I'm visiting Tampa, which is going to be pretty soon. I'm going to be in Tampa in the beginning of August for a conference. I need to know where should I go for a great meal? Great. There's one place that comes to mind that is very unique. It's a All European right. style food hall. It's just outside of downtown on the northwest side of downtown. It's called the Armature Works. And they've taken this old factory and converted it to some restaurants. It's right on the river, right on the Hillsborough River, just north of downtown, just north of the University of Tampa. And inside, there's a couple of restaurants on the side, but in the main part, a dozen different types of food that you can go in and get. And they are all just outstanding. It opened probably five or six years ago. And it is one of the most popular places. They've got this big lawn out in front with the, the jumbo sized checkers for the kids and, you know, tables for people to socialize and stuff like that. It is packed nice. and it has some of the best food. Um, and you have a wide variety of choices because there's, I said, there's probably eight, 10, maybe even 12 different um, kind of to go eateries inside. But then you got these two different restaurants at either end. So for variety and for quality, that's probably at the top of the list. We have all the chains here. Uh, you know, there's a place called Datz's Deli. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. If you like deli food, they're in South Tampa. Mm -hmm. They're more of a kind of a modern twist on the deli. Again, outstanding. Um, Burns Steakhouse, one of the top steakhouses in the country, uh, is just in South Tampa as well. So there's no shortage of eateries here. And I eat my way around. When I travel, I eat my way around the world. Yeah. And I, I love food and Tampa. I got to be honest with you. I've lived in probably 14 or 15 different places in my life. Mm -hmm. And Tampa ranks right up there at the top in terms of the quality, the variety of food choices that you have here. Good to know. It sounds like we have a lot in common. So I'm going to look you up in the beginning of August. We'll Please go to some of these restaurants and we'll go eat our way through Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'd love it. <laughs> All right. So if our student listeners, if they want to speak, if they want you to speak on their college campus, start talking about, you know, emotional intelligence, all of this great stuff that you're working on and then maybe eventually get the new book, uh, where should they go in order to connect with you? The easiest way is probably my St. Leo email address. I get that on my phone. I've been constantly, even though I'm on summer right now, I still have access to that email and I'm still monitoring it all the time. So it's andrew.gold, very simple at stleo.edu and that's all spelled out s-a-i-n-t-l-e-o.edu that's probably the best way to reach me fantastic dr gold let me tell you you've got some great information i can't wait to read your new book so please get that book out there as soon as possible so that way i can promote that to all of our fraternity and sorority members that can use that help with emotional intelligence and thank you so much for sharing all this great information with our audience I'm, I'm honored for, to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And, and we'll look forward to having you in Tampa here in another few weeks and, and having some good food together. That sounds good to me. So thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. If you like this talk with Drew, make sure that you like it. Share it on social media with other students that need to hear more on emotional intelligence. And we will see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. 